You know, amazingly, I expected people to ask the question, but I actually heard some people starting to talk about their response. That's wonderful. <laughs> oh, my. Life is a journey. Or maybe we should say a series of journeys put together. <clears throat> Most journeys, you know where they're going. You know where you are going. You have a start and an end date set. And these days you have an itinerary for where it's going to take you each day. And if you get lost, you know what you do, right? Come on, you pull out the smartphone, you go to the maps, and, and get Google Maps and say, uh, where am I, or Siri, where am I? And you get the directions, right? And the message comes up, rerouting, one moment please. But you make preparations for your journeys. Our young kids had it right on the nose this morning, huh? All the preparations that you had to make. Bags are packed according to plans you're making. Now, I was up in Luther Springs, and I heard that they had a, an event or an experience of a teenage girl who came up there, and she brought enough clothes with her. She had three or four outfits for each day, none of them which had anything to do with being in an outdoor camp setting. Now, now, to tell you that that's not always the way it goes, Nancy and I, when we traveled to Germany for my dad's 80th birthday a few years ago, traveled over with nothing more than a medium-sized carry-on for the whole week that we were there, and she could make it work. But I digress. <laughs> my parents are visiting with us for a few days on their way to a cruise. With today's technology, I was actually able to track their plane their connecting flight uh, from San Diego to Houston and from Houston across the Gulf of Mexico, I could watch their plane actually make its way across and arrive at Fort Lauderdale three minutes early yesterday afternoon. And they're going to visit several islands in the Caribbean for the next few weeks. Now, if I know them, what do you think the chances are of that, huh? That I might know them? <laughs> if I know mom, they've been packing for about a week getting everything ready. They probably had everything ready a few days before they left. Now, I could tell you that that's because they're German. But then me, I think I'm German too, and I packed the night before I'm leaving for something. So that doesn't work. But maybe some of you know what I'm talking about because you've been on a cruise, or, or like Nancy has talked about, or as Karen has talked about, you, you, you've been the stopping place. You've known people coming on a cruise and the, the luggage that they come and they bring with them and everything that they have that they're ready for. You know, we're here in the cruise stop of the, uh, of the Americas in South Florida, right? But you know, sometimes even when a trip has an itinerary, and everything is well planned out, the bags are packed in time, things can still happen that are not part of the plan. I still remember what may well rank as the trip of my life when my brother and I traveled to Germany together for five weeks to visit family. We were 16. Oh, what an adventure. And these two good folks here, they didn't come with us. We went on our own. Details were planned out months in advance. We spent most of the first four weeks in Hamburg, a city I came to love, even though it's been a long time since I've last been there. That's my dad's home city. A cousin helped us to get student transit passes. We got on the buses and the subways. We got all around that city. And then we had a train pass that took us to München, Munich, where my brother-in-law and sister lived at that time with their family and their four children. The fifth one wasn't born yet. Actually, I'm not even sure the fourth one was born yet back then. And we traveled and we went and we visited, and I traveled with a question, a searching. I had been raised in the church, the Lutheran church, baptized and confirmed. Side note here, baptized, by the way, by your former interim pastor. And if you remember Pastor Fred Alman? Well, <clears throat> so many years ago, uh, he was the pastor of Christ Lutheran Church in Little Neck, New York, 
uh, when two immigrants got off of a plane and made that their home church. And that same Pastor Fred Alman, who was your interim pastor here for a while, baptized my brother and I. I invited him to come and worship with us this morning, but I found out that he just recently had knee surgery, and uh, so he was not able to come. So say a prayer for him. While I was raised up in the church, yet I had a sense inside of me that there was still something missing. And so I thought, I will ask my brother-in-law, Peter, a pastor, for some ideas on how to get our youth group on the right track. What could he suggest and what could he provide information for me? That was my thought, my question, my searching. Because I felt like even though I was in church, there had to be something more. Well, that's where the plans took on a whole new way of life. We went with them to church in Munich, and there was an energy and an excitement in the air. That whole week, my brother-in-law and sister shared with us about how God had worked in their lives, opened doors for them, directed them in their steps, shared with them, uh, they, and they shared with me and, and my brother the strength of their faith. And by the time we got to a home group meeting at their home later that week, I knew there was something that I wanted to know more about. And it wasn't just about the youth group thing. It was this thing called faith that they had a hold of. A living faith. Breathing, energizing, and empowering faith. And I found in their conversations that, and the time that we had together, I, found like, I felt like I found the missing piece of a puzzle that I had been looking for without even knowing exactly what it was. And it made the picture whole. And if I fast forward through all the years that have passed, today I have in my hands, well, I will if I pick it up, a letter of call signed by Don Henry and Gisela, I couldn't find you there for a moment, huh? and now also by Bishop Robert Schaefer, that has the audacity to proclaim that I have a new call to a living faith at Living Faith Lutheran Church. Isn't that amazing? I find it amazing. And I'm grateful and, and see that God has done something in my life through a journey that I took when I was only 16 years old. Something happened on that journey that allowed me to be here today. Something I couldn't have planned or even imagined at the time. I wonder what Peter's journey was like with Jesus on that day. When they were going to go up that holy mountain. We are told in the text that it was six days later. So there was an itinerary. There was a plan. I doubt whether Peter knew what was in store for him. Much like James and John, they had no clue. Did Jesus know what was about to happen? Did he suspect? Did he think what might happen, that the heavens might open in the transfiguration? We don't know. But what did happen that day needed a response from the disciples. Here was Jesus standing with, talking with the lead representatives of their faith. Moses, who brought the law and, the, and, the, uh, and brought the people towards the promised land. And Elijah, who, the, the prophet who worked so hard to bring the people back into the, to line, to, to redirect them from their troubled ways. Here they are, both of them, standing and talking with Jesus, their rabbi. And so Peter came up with a response, just like Peter, if you study Peter in the scriptures at all, always ready with something to say. And he says, it's good for us to be here, Lord. We're excited. And if you wish, I, I will make three dwellings right here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Now, some people call them dwellings. Some people, some texts say that they're tents. Some say that they're like houses. But regardless, Peter wants to build right here, right now, at this place, at this moment, at this point in time. 
You've got to give him credit. He keeps on trying. But he doesn't get an answer to his question. At least not the answer that he was expecting. Because just at that moment, all heaven broke loose. Hmm? It wasn't enough that Jesus had been transfigured. His face shining like the sun, glowing with his clothes, dazzling white, speaking to undeniably the two most important people of the Jewish faith. But now this, a voice coming out of the cloud that suddenly overshadowed them, like coming into a dense, thick, early morning fog and bright. And the voice, not to be confused with his chances of becoming America's next greatest singer. <laughs> the voice speaks to him, really, and says, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. That's the response he gets. Now, when Jesus goes to pick them up off the ground, oh yeah, <laughs> He needed to pick them up off the ground at that point. And he speaks these words to them. He says to them, do not be afraid. Our young people picked up on that this morning too, right? They had their fears and the things that they are worried about. And what does Jesus say to us in that moment? Do not be afraid. They had every reason to be afraid. But when they look up, they are alone again. The question about building dwellings was never answered because the action that had taken place was already over and now they were headed back down, back down the hill, the mountain. And so there are four things, four principles maybe from this story to recognize. One is it's good, it's important even to have a plan, to have an itinerary to have a searching spirit so that when we go on the journey, there is something that we're looking for. And as important as it is, it is also important to have an opportunity to go up the mountain. Go up to the place where you can meet with God. Moses went up to the mountain. Elijah went up to the mountain. Peter, even in the end in our second lesson, talks about the experience when he had been to the mountain. First thing that I did after I resigned my position with hospice having a call here was to go up to Luther Springs for a couple of days. You know, a place to be away, a place to get to and to hear the voice of God. We need to get to a place like that, some place where we can go and be transfigured and we can hear from God. So it's important to have a plan, it's important to have an opportunity it's also, number three, it's okay to change the plans when we realize that they're not God's purpose. And then finally, what do you do when you get to the top of the mountain? Hmm? What do you do, folks? You rest, you receive, hopefully, you, you hear, you celebrate, you rejoice, and then what? You pray. You pray. That's a good one while you're up there. Take some time to pray. And then you stay there, right? And you think. You don't stay there. You've got to come back down. <coughs> Just like Jesus took them back down from the mountaintop. You see, we can't stay up on the mountaintop because in the final analysis, it's down here in the nitty-gritty of the everyday world where the problems are real and the reality is cold everywhere except Florida. Because that's where your transfigured self is supposed to be. Not up on the top of the mountain for the rest of the time. You go there to have your spirit renewed and refreshed, to be transfigured, to be transformed. But then you've got to go back down the mountain to where everything else is going on. Because that's where you're going to make a difference. That's where you're going to take the plans that you have. The questions that you raise, the searching spirit in your heart, and put it all together as a transfigured, transformed child of God 
who has reached out to God, who has been spoken to in the heights of the mountaintop experience, and then come back down, ready to make a difference. Somebody could say amen to that. Amen. Living faith, I am excited about being your new pastor today. I see here a congregation that has a plan, just like Peter, saying, if you wish, Lord, let us build. Yes, we want a place. We need a place. But we're not only building a building, we're building a congregation. We're building a people. We're building a community. And I'm excited that that plan includes a partnership with our connectional body, of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in the Florida Bahamas Synod, with all the joys and, yes, sometimes the frustrations that those connections entail, I am excited that we are being commissioned into a partnership to enter into a renewal program, a three-year initiative to go back down from the mountaintop experience to equip us as pastor and congregation joined together for bring, to bring us training and coaching and networks to increase our capacity for spiritual and numerical growth. Friends, how many of you got a chance to read the report that Ruben Duran wrote that was included in the congregational meeting? I hope you had a chance to read it. But one of their hopes and expectations for us as I read through is that we would double in size over the next three years. Mm -hmm. My first Sunday that I was here with Pastor Rosa, he talked about what would it look like if we had to go and have people outside on the balcony. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that vision has been there. We need to see how God is going to make it happen and how we're going to be part of that. That renewal program talks about establishing and developing further a culture of generosity by supporting other ministries. In essence, for us to continue to learn how to give ourselves away into the transforming work of God. I hear in that an opportunity and an obligation to hear and see the needs of our community in a new way and to develop our mission to the community. Maybe we need to ask ourselves, what languages do we need to speak if we're going to reach out into this community? Possiblemente tenemos que aprender a hablar con los otros vecinos en español y ofrecer como oportunidad para servirlos en el nombre de Cristo. Amen. Maybe we have to do that. Maybe we have to extend ourselves in Spanish. Maybe we have to learn the language of the nuns. And somebody's saying, Pastor, why are you bringing the Catholic religious sisters into this picture here? To learn the language of the nuns. I remember nuns when I was in grade school. And they, oh no, that's not what we're talking about. It's not nuns as in the Catholic sisters. It's nuns as in N-O-N-E-S. Have you heard that? It's about those who in this day and age, when asked about their religious background, mark the box that says, none. They have no religious background. Bishop Schaefer has been writing about his own learning about the nuns and the gifts that they have to offer the church and how they respond when they see a people who approach them with honesty and integrity. We have to learn their language as well. We have to learn the opportunity to learn, uh, use the opportunity to learn about social media, how we can use technology and things like Facebook to reach out to those who are out there already. I have to share with you a, a, a word of um, Explanation. I bought a new computer this week because my old one from 2007 just wasn't cutting it anymore. And I bought this new computer. This is an XPS 18 because it has great display. And I was going to project up on the, on the TV screen that you folks have you know, the, the, some, some highlights from the sermon. And guess what? Couldn't make it work. <laughs> didn't happen. It will happen, but it just didn't. It wasn't ready for today. And I said, well, that's okay, because, you know, on my first Sunday, trying to figure things out and where things are at, I'm just going to stick with the old-fashioned, let me print this out and have it ready. Well, guess what? The printer didn't work either. <laughs> so I'm using a sort of hybrid. I'm actually reading from my script on the, on the computer this morning, because it's all here. And I'm thinking, wow, this might work. This might be better than having to print it out every week. We'll see. But here's my point. 
If Martin Luther didn't use the new technology that they call the printing press to put the Word of God into everybody's hands in his day and age, then we wouldn't be sitting here today because nobody would have shared the faith with us that came to us through his efforts and through the, through the translations that became available, putting the Word of God into our hands. We have it now so freely and readily available that we sometimes don't even read it the way we ought to because it's too easy. But today's age, we need to say, how are we going to use the newest technology and the newest ways to bring our, uh, our message of love and grace and hope to people who have never experienced it before? We have the opportunity to shape our mission and our ministry into a new building opportunity that will help determine what we as a community of faith look like to others and how effective we are. Now, I don't know how that sounds to you. All of that put together may be a little bit daunting. Maybe we will need Jesus occasionally to pick us up from the ground and say, Do not be afraid. Come down with me. We have a lot to learn. We have room to grow. We have opportunities in abundance. And we can and will do it when we open ourselves up to our own transfiguration. So, what does your transfiguration look like? Somebody say, phew. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little overwhelming, but we're going to take it one step at a time. And we're going to be thankful to God along the way, because this is the journey that God has for us. Amen. And I am excited to be here with you and to see what God is going to do in our midst. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.